All right, all right. Well, uh, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, our guest for today, Mr. Tundu Lisu, who comes here. Thank you. It is, uh, it is an honor uh, to have Mr. Lisu with us today. Uh, bear with me for a moment. I've, I've prepared a bit of an introduction to give you a, a, a sense of the road that he has traveled uh, on, his way, uh, on his way here. Mr. Lisu is trained in law, originally earned his law degree from Tanzania's uh, University of Dar es Salaam, uh, before moving on to the University of Warwick in the UK to earn a legal master's degree, uh, returned to Tanzania uh, to practice law for many years uh, with a particular emphasis in environmental issues uh, and indigenous land rights, uh, especially uh, in that intersection where corporate interests and indigenous land rights tend to produce some, uh, produce some friction. Uh, for a short period of time, he served as the president of the Tanganyika Law Society, which is Tanzania's version of our American Bar Association, the national uh, professional association that governs the, the practice of law. He first entered politics in 2010 when he won uh, the, the parliamentary seat for his home district, and he held that seat uh, for years uh, until 2019. It was during this time that he rose as a member of the opposition Chidema party uh, and was a vocal critic and continues to be to this day uh, of the governing regime uh, in Tanzania. Uh, among other activities, he was central to the preparation of a report uh, that went public showing how senior officials were stealing money from public funds uh, and even openly criticized then president Magufuli uh, and what he called him a petty dictator. Uh, he's also an active scholar. Uh, he's work, currently working on his second book. Uh, his first book is out. Uh, I will admit I have not read it cover to cover, but I have read the synopsis. I think we're going to hear uh, some of it today. The topic of which uh, is how parliamentary and executive structures of the government facilitate rather than uh, impede corruption. Elements of the ruling party in Tanzania have tried repeatedly to silence him. We're glad you're here. Culminating uh, in an assassination attempt on his life in September of 2017. Leading up to that, uh, in that year alone, he was arrested eight times. He was struck with 16 bullets, one of which is still in his body. He spent 14 months nonstop in hospitals in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and in uh, Leuven, Belgium, being treated. Uh, and as he told me this afternoon, uh, with a total of 25 surgeries. He still carries his wallet or has his wallet that has four bullet holes in it. He briefly returned to Tanzania to serve uh, as the Chidema Opposition Party's candidate for the 2020 political election. Uh, earlier this year, he returned to Tanzania full-time, I believe, uh, returning from uh, from exile uh, in Belgium. Uh, and just last month, uh, he was arrested and briefly detained on his way to a community organizing meeting uh, around indigenous land rights uh, in the northwest part of the country, uh, I believe it was. Right. Mr. Lisa, we're very happy to, to have you here. And we look forward to, to learning about your experiences uh, and about what uh, how corrupt structures operate uh, from a ground level view. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Nice that you can do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> Probably want to use the last. Um, I want to put my knots here or here. Well, that's not. I think, first of all, uh, please allow me to uh, say thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you, share some of the, share some of my stories, the stories of my country, the stories from Tanzania, and I have stories from Africa. Because what I'm going to say about Tanzania today, and 
has a lot of resonance in what is happening in many other African countries. Uh, they are not just African stories, I think they are also very human stories. Because the issues that we are dealing with, the issues that I have dealt with, are very human issues. Corruption, malgovernance, abuse of power in its multifarious ways. So these are these are human stories. I think they will most likely also we will also find in them American stories too. Uh, Sayenki has said I was arrested last month going to political rally uh, to show solidarity to the community, the community that is threatened with eviction from their ancestral land, uh, the Maasai of Ugorongoro. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Tanzania. But the Serengeti in Gorongoro is one of the most beautiful places on this earth. And that beauty has caused a lot of harm to the local people. Uh, the people who are threatened with eviction today were actually evicted in 1959 to create the modern day Serengeti National Park. So when you see those beautiful scenes of animal migration, which involve the movement of more than a million wildlife between Northern Tanzania and Kenya, when you see those vast empty spaces, empty of human beings, you should know that they are empty not because there were no people there to begin with. They are empty not because that is pristine nature. They are empty because the original inhabitants were driven out of those lands in order to create those empty spaces. Now, those who were, who were kicked out in 1959 to create Serengeti are now being kicked out and if we allow it to happen, they will be transported uh, some 547 kilometers away to a land where they were not born, where they know nobody, where they are not used to. It is the Maasai's version of the Trail of Tears, if you know what I mean. You know the trail of tears? So, so when I say Tanzanian stories are human stories, uh, nearly 200 years after Andrew Jackson uh, drove out those five civilized tribes from southeastern United States to the west of the Mississippi, we are seeing the same thing in Tanzania. So these are human stories. But I want to talk about the structures and institutions, the governance structures and institutions and the processes that allow these things to happen. I want to talk about our constitutional politics and the way those constitutional politics have allowed abuse of power, corporate abuse of power, and I'll, I'll come to that very briefly, uh, very shortly, how our constitutional and legal structures and institution governance structures have created the conditions that allow corruption to thrive. 
and that allow abuse of power and human rights abuses of the most horrible nature to, to happen. Now, to start with, uh, in documents made public recently in British courts in London, uh, we now know that Barrick Gold Corporation Barrick Gold Corporation is one of the top three leading gold producers in this world. It's a, a Canadian multinational mining company based in Toronto. We now know as a result of the publication of those public documents in English courts that for years, Barrick Gold was paying the Tanzanian police and intelligence and security apparatus to keep the peace in the company's three gold mines in Tanzania. Uh, Barrick Gold, according, according to those documents, was paying monthly, monthly, was making monthly cash transfers officially to the Tanzanian police force and to the intelligence and security uh, agency to make payments for police officers, paramilitary units, and intelligence officers to keep the communities at bay in the areas around the mines. Now, you would wonder why, why would a Canadian mining company pay millions of dollars to Tanzanian security forces to keep the peace, what has happened in those areas. Uh, in Tanzania's mining fields, Tanzania is Africa's third largest gold producer now, now, in the process, the process of transforming the country into the third largest producer of gold in Africa involved a state-organized violence against hundreds of thousands of rural people who were living in the lands which are now gold mines owned by Barrick and tens of thousands of artisanal gold miners who worked those fields before Barrick moved in. So the process of Barrick obtaining uh, the, the gold reserves that it currently exploits in Tanzania was a very violent one. It involved forcible evictions of perhaps hundreds of thousands of people. My first arrest uh, came on Christmas Eve of 2002, and it was because for three years I had been, I had led a campaign to expose the human rights abuses associated with those evictions, with Barrick acquiring those areas. So it has been paying millions of dollars to Tanzanian gov security uh, agencies in order to keep to continue keeping the communities out. When the documents were released uh, a, a few weeks ago, it made major, uh, you know, it was front page news in one of the leading and uh, news, you know, British newspapers. Uh, it, it was on the, the Times of London. Uh, it was on the, the Financial Times and so on. It came as a surprise to, to many. But it did not come as a surprise at all to those of us who had been involved in the fight against this company. It didn't come as a surprise to the thousands the tens of thousands of communities whose lands were taken away by force 
to make room for Barrick to build it, its gold mines. In other words, we have known for years that for Barrick to operate, they have had to pay off a lot of people within the government of Tanzania. They have had to pay a lot of people within our, our security agencies. So it didn't come as a surprise to, all, to us at all. The mere fact that the proceedings that led to the publication of these documents in London, instead of perhaps Dar es Salaam, should tell you something about Tanzania. I spent more than a decade trying to prosecute Barik in our courts. It didn't work at all. It didn't work at all. I didn't get nowhere. It couldn't get a hearing anywhere in our courts. Couldn't get any sympathy anywhere within our government or the press. And then we realized that maybe we have to find ways of fighting them in courts where there is a possibility of getting a hearing. And that's how we went to, we went to uh, Great Britain. So cases that have been filed in the UK uh, have led to publication of these documents. And there is a lot of stuff that has come out as a result. And perhaps those who could not get justice in Tanzanian courts may get justice in British courts after all. It is because our courts are part of the problem. Our courts are thoroughly, thoroughly corrupt. And they have been corrupted by these big corporate players such as Barrick. Now I said I want, I want to talk about the, the constitutional structures, the constitutional and legal structures that allow these things to happen. So I would like to give you uh, some background about our, our, our constitutional order, our political and constitutional order. Uh, and that, to me, is where the central problem of corruption lies and the central problem of abuse of power and abuse of office. Tanzania has a, a political system and a constitutional system that resembles somewhat the American political system. We are not a parliamentary democracy. We are a presidential, a presidentialist democracy. We have an executive presidency like the United States. We have, we don't have, we don't call ours a Supreme Court, but we have our version of the Supreme Court. It is called the Court of Appeal of Tanzania. It is both an appellate court as well as the, the, the a court of original jurisdiction. Uh, we have parliament. It is not a two-chamber parliament like your Congress. It is a single-chamber parliament. Now, where is... Where is the problem? The problem is Tanzania's constitutional order, our constitutional order is built around the presidency. Our president, our president and our presidency has been described by constitutional scholars as an imperial presidency. 
an imperial presidency in the sense that the Tanzanian president enjoys the kind of powers, of constitutional powers that were enjoyed by European monarchs of the time before the, the, the 19th century revolutions, the, the, the edge of revolutions uh, in the 1840s and so on. Our president enjoys absolute powers. Our president is not only a head of state, he or she, now we have a she. Can I have some water? Is that possible? Yeah, please. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Our, our president, now it's a she, uh, enjoys the kind of powers that are similar to the powers that 18th century European monarchs enjoyed unlimited powers. She's the head of state. She's the chief of government. She is the commander in chief of the armed services, of all of our armed services, including prisons and the police force. Our police force is a national police force. As a head of state, the Tanzanian president is also part of parliament. Our constitution, our constitution is, our, our parliament is divided into two parts. You have the House of Representatives, it is called the National Assembly, composed of elected, semi elected, and unelected members. And the other part, is the president. Now you only find that model in, in, in Britain. You only find that model in Imperial Britain. The British king is always a part of the of the of, of British Parliament. Now our president is part of, of our parliament. So when we say imperial presidency, in fact, it is, it is literally true. It, it, our president has powers and privileges and uh, prerogatives that are similar to uh, uh, British, British kings or British monarchs. So he, she is now, but that she is, she, that, that is she, she is part of parliament. She not only ascends to bills that are enacted into laws, she also gets to appoint a certain number of members of parliament. So our parliament, unlike the, the House of Representatives here or Senate, our National Assembly is made up not only of members elected in constituencies, it also is composed of members who are appointed by the president, 10 of them. As, as head of state, our president has power not only to summon parliament to seat or to, or to prorogue it, to prorogue is to send it home. Our president has powers to even dissolve the National Assembly. He can dissolve our parliament. I wonder if the President of the United States has powers to dissolve Congress. No. <laughs> Ours does. If a parliament, if our parliament passes a law that the president does not like, he can veto it. The parliament can, has power to override that veto. If the president still doesn't like the, the law, he has power to send parliament packing. So in terms of the relationship between 
the presidency and the legislature, the shadow of the president towers over the, 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 our legislature. The, there is no check and balances there. The president is, has the most, he has more influence, even inside parliament. As chief of government, the president of Tanzania appoints everyone, anyone of consequence. He appoints, again, she, now that she's a lady, she appoints all ministers and their deputies. She appoints all heads of government departments, heads of independent institutions of the government, like public universities. She appoints uh, local, re district, and regional administrators. She appoints all judges and other senior judicial officers and administrators. She appoints all members of constitutional commissions, constitutional or statutory commissions, commissions such as the National Electoral Commission. So she gets to appoint the heads and members of the Electoral Commission, you know, the Judicial Service Commission, every commission that you can think of. It's, it's uh, chairpersons and members are appointed by the president and their chief executives. She appoints the clerk of the National Assembly. The clerk of the National Assembly is the chief executive officer of parliament. She appoints all the service chiefs, the armed forces, and commanders of individual units of the armed forces. She appoints the police chiefs and senior police officers. And the constitution declares that for those public servants who are not directly appointed by the president, they are deemed to be appointed by her and they work on her behalf. So think of a clerk or a cleaner in a courtroom somewhere in rural Tanzania, and she is deemed by our constitution to be appointed by the president, and she works on behalf of the president. Because the president appoints all judges, you can be sure that our judiciary is not independent at all. Uh, she not only appoints judges, she is also the ultimate dis disciplinary authority over all judicial, judicial officer, officers. He is, she is the ultimate disciplinary authority over all public servants in the country. She can hire and fire anybody. She has powers to constitute and to disestablish public offices. She can create ministries and appoint ministers as she wants. It is a complete discretion. So when we speak of imperial presidency, that is what we mean. A, a, a presidency of this type is not only powerful, it is also protected against accountability. It is protected against any form of accountability. Our president cannot be charged in court with any crime for anything she or he might do while in office. So the immunity is complete, is complete. What is happening now here with Donald Trump is unheard of in Tanzania. In fact, people are shocked that these Americans 
are, pro are, prosec are prosecuting a former president for actions that he may have done while he was a sitting president. That is unthinkable for a country like Tanzania because the president enjoys complete immunity from prosecution. And that is why you have a spectacle of a former president, uh, Benim Kappa, he was our third president, uh, in 2019, a year before he died, he, he published his memoir in which he explains somewhere about how he and some of his senior uh, advisors uh, connived to steal a hundred million US dollars from the Bank of Tanzania, from our central bank, in order to provide campaign funds for the ruling party, for his ruling, for, for his party and its presidential candidate. So President Jakaya Kikwete, our fourth president, was elected, if we have to believe President Mkapa, was elected uh, on stolen money. So think of a an American president writing memoirs in which he's saying, well, I was a thief and he getting, getting away with it. So President Kappa could get away with it because the immunity against prosecution for former presidents is near total. And we have seen time and again, presidents, our presidents, while in office, committing crimes for which if they were committed by somebody else, they would send that somebody else to prison for many, many years. Uh, stealing has become institutionalized and it is organized at the very highest levels of our government. It is done fairly openly. And it is done that way because our, our constitution has given complete protection to presidents. It is not just immunity against, protect, uh, against prosecution. Our presidents also have prerogatives uh, that remind you of 18th century European monarchs. Our president can pardon convicted criminals regardless of whatever crime they may have committed. I know that is an issue here too. Now the, 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 the prerogative of mercy as that is that, 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 that thing is called is a drawback to European monarchies of the type that was led the, 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 the patriots in this country to fight the British. Prerogative of mercy, so he can pardon prisoners uh, regardless of their, of their crimes. Uh, the president can declare war, states of emergency, he has powers to detain citizens without taking them to court. Uh, this is an innovation, one of the first innovations of independent Tanganyika, by the way. The British, in spite of the oppressive nature of the British colonial state in, in, in Tanganyika and other colonies, they never had detention without trial. That is a post-colonial innovation. So, in brief, in brief, the president, the presidential shadow hovers over the nation like, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's horrible. You cannot run away from the evil shadow of the presidency. Our president controls, has near total control 
of the electoral process. She gets to appoint members of the National Electoral Commission and its chief executive officer, as well as those who declare results in a presidential election, the returning officers in electoral districts. Our law requires uh, local government executives to be returning officers in general elections, and all of these are presidential appointees. So the entire machinery of elections is controlled by the president. The president exercises uh, influence, uh, more influence in constitu constituency demarcation in what you Americans call redistricting. And you cannot believe the gerrymandering that, ha that, has, that system has allowed. The president basically uh, has carried out redistricting of the country in ways which defy logic. But it is because he has all these, all these powers. Now, in terms of, of decision-making, you can, you can imagine that kind of power. It is without any restraint. It is without any meaningful checks and balances. And therefore, it allows, it, is, it creates very fertile breeding ground for very high level corruption. And the stories that we have endured in Tanzania in the past three decades uh, prove this. Uh, our second president, uh, the first president was a very clean man. He created this system, but he was a very clean man. Our second president, started to exercise his presidential powers in ways which have become now common, using the constitutional powers that he has, he has for self-enrichment. It has become a pandemic now, and it is done openly. So we have a situation where, in the latest installment of these never-ending scandals, we have a situation where the current president, the lady Samia, has just privatized all of Tanzania's ports and harbors and related transport infrastructure to a company. You probably know, we may have heard it. They tried to get some ports here, Dubai Port World. Uh, Dubai Port World is a government-owned, a, 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 port, a port operator that is owned by the government of Dubai, of, of Dubai, by the Emirate of Dubai. In a deal signed in October of last year, the president uh, has given all of Tanzania's sea and lake ports to Dubai Port World for a time that is unlimited, for a term that is unlimited. The agreement says the, that deal will come to an end if one of two things happen. One, if either the individual agreements in respect of each particular port comes to an end, and we have we have more than 20 sea and lake ports. So if individual agreements concerning any of those 20 plus ports come to an end, then the agreement will come to an end. Or if the activities undertaken under the agreement are completed. Now, an agreement to run ports, to manage ports, to develop ports. When will it come to an end? When will we stop having ports? 
so that they cannot be managed, so that they cannot be improved. You know? So it is unlimited. The, 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 the term is unlimited. As long as we have ports, we will need to manage them. We will need to improve them. We will need to expand them. And therefore, Dubai Port World will continue to, to manage our, our ports. The deal says the agreement cannot be terminated under any circumstances, even if there is a breach of diplomatic relations between Tanzania and Dubai, or if there is any other reason or circumstance, including even if it is contrary to international law. The president signed on it. For once, our president did it personally. Uh, they, the practice has always been they will hide behind their ministers. In this one, Samia's own hand is is on the on the document it was taken to parliament and it was passed inside one week no debate so and we have seen these kinds of of um, of of actions now to conclude to conclude therefore if you want to understand why countries are, some countries are so corrupt, I think that it is important to examine the constitutional and institutional arrangements that are in place that allow uh, governments or government officials to get away with, with these kinds of, of abuses. If the constitutions and the, the statutes pr provide the kind of, of unlimited powers to government officials the way they do in countries like Tanzania, then where absolute, where they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So where there's absolute power, the Uh, in other words, if we want solutions to problems of corruption, we must address the institutional and structural uh, uh, issues, the, the, the institutional, the constitutional schemes that allow them to, to flourish. That, that is why in Tanzania for the past 30 years, we have called for constitutional reform. Uh, in order to create uh, constitutional structures which will enable us to hold our to account their powers in our our names i say these are uh, the stories from tanzania are human stories uh, what what you see in tanzania you will see in many countries on the continent and beyond Africa. So thank you once again for, thank you for the opportunity. And I will answer your, thank you. I'll answer your questions if any. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, we're, we're happy to open it up. Of course, I've got a list of my long uh, questions, which isn't gonna surprise anybody, but what will be a surprise is I'm gonna step back for a while, and I'm going to let you drive the conversation for as long as you like. I so think now you should allow me to sit down. Yeah, sit for this one. Have that. Jacob, please. How aware, and then maybe thus divided, is the Tanzanian people when it comes to this issue of constitutional issues that come up? Like How divided we are? Right, yeah. I guess we are divided as you can imagine, there are people. And we have a policy like Tanzania uh, will always have 
those who benefit from the system, you will have always people who, because they benefit, they aid and abet the system. You will have people who, because they benefit, they justify the system. And we have our fair share of those. And there are people who, for a variety of reasons, just don't think that their problems have anything to do with the way the, con the, the country's governance is organized. Uh, people think that they are poor because, you know, God did not, uh, you know, bless them with, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 it's, it's a very popular saying in Tanzania, you know, God is a giver. Yeah? So you have people stealing money left, right, and center. They're becoming very rich. And there are millions who think that, well, these are blessed by God. Yeah? So, so we are, we are, the country is not united on the need for constitutional reform, as you, I think, expect. Of, of any country in, in circumstances such as this. Yeah. Yes? Yes, please? Um, I just had a question about you referencing the first president as a clean man <laughs> and then the second president as um, focusing on self enrichment. What did this change between the two? Our first president, as I say, created this system. The constitutional, the constitutional foundations of Tanzania today were laid in, and our presided over that system for 24 years. He left office in 1985. He was always the first to admit that he had enormous powers. I think he, he once had an interview with the BBC in which he said, "Look." I have sufficient powers under the constitution and the laws to be a dictator. And many people say he wasn't a dictator. And we say he was, he certainly didn't, he didn't steal. He was a very simple man. Uh, I was joking earlier in the day that uh, he was a son of a chief and the chiefs tend to be very extravagant. But he was a very simple man. He, had, he was like a monk. Yeah, you would notice any of his children on Tanzanian streets today, while you would almost immediately single out a Mwini. Mwini was our second president. You would immediately single out the, his, his children. You would single out the children of Kikwete because they are ministers. The wife is in parliament. Uh, you know. Nowadays, after two years in office, uh, you would almost immediately single out Samia's son because suddenly he's the go-to person if you want to have things your way. So why, why, why is it that this president, who was otherwise very clean, uh, what, what is this contradiction that uh, you have a a very clean president being succeeded by these corrupt successors. I think the answer lies in the power structures that he created. Uh, he created a presidency which was totally unaccountable to anyone or any, any institution. And human beings are human beings. You know, you have few clean ones, and then you have everybody else who may not be who may not necessarily be corrupt at the beginning, but once they get into power and they realize how powerful they can be and how rich they can become and get away with it, and they change. So, so the I think the the secret lies in the in in this imperial presidency, in this constitutional scheme that was created in 1962. Yes, I saw that one, and then to you. 
yeah, to follow up on that question, I was just thinking like, why was the first president given like so much power at the start uh, when making the constitution? Were there any objection to that? That's my first question. And then the second question is, do you see it any way out for Tanzania in the future? I mean, you mentioned briefly about constitutional reform, but then given the president with such unchecked and unlimited power, she would definitely, or he would definitely not willing to give out that power willingly. So do you see any way out for the country? I think I'll start with the second. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't be doing what I, I do if I, I wasn't hopeful that we can, we can change. Uh, I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll have a better deal, a much better deal than we have had for many, many years. But I know, I'm not naive, I know that it will be very, very difficult. It will be very, very costly. Uh, uh, but the Tanzanian people, as all other peoples, can only put up with this kind of abuses for a time. And uh, in, in recent years, the calls for reform have grown so much. I, I, I believe we will win at the end of the day. We will we'll get a better deal than we have than we have had. Uh, with regard to the, the first, what happened in 1962? Why was the president allowed to have this kind of system? Well, I, my book tells that story. My my book, the remaining remaining in the shadows, uh, tells that story uh, in great detail. But briefly. We get independence in 1961 from uh, the British. And the constitutional order that we inherited from the British was one of a Westminster, what is called the Westminster model, a parliamentary democracy. We didn't have a president. We had a prime minister as head of, as head of government. Now, as, as you may know, in a parliamentary democracy, a prime minister is, is amenable to removal by parliament on a simple motion of no confidence. Uh, and, and, and prime ministers in parliamentary democracies are easily uh, restrained by, by, by parliament. So in that one, in the first year of independence, Nyerere, uh, the president, there would be president, there was a prime minister, and he immediately started, uh, you know, the campaign to move away from the, the Westminster model. The argument was, this is a model that we, we, we were given by these colonialists, yeah? This is a model that makes for a very weak government. We need a strong government in order to bring development faster. You know, we need a government that will transform the country. The ideology of developmentalism. Everything was done in the name of development. So we need a strong government in order to quicken the pace of development. The argument was we should run while others are walking. You know, we should catch up with the rest of the world. And to catch up with the rest of the world, we need a strong government. Uh, and, and so that's what happened. Now, the strange thing, in, in the government prepared a white paper on the republic, on, on what the system was going to be like. So we had a, we had a, a government white paper on Tanganyika Republic. Now, in there, it was written, as historians have said, that actually that was Nyerere's handwork. He wrote it himself. It's the argument for a republic. Now, in, the, in, the, the, in that white paper, the, the government argued, and the words are very instructive, the, what was their vision of this president, who was, what type of this president, what type of leader was this president going to be? And he said, 
uh, for us, and I'm, I'm actually quoting, for us, the powers, privileges, and prerogatives of a king or chief are not separated from the authority that he wields. And they will not be differentiated, they will not be different from the powers, privileges, and prerogatives of the president in our republic. So here is Nyerere arguing that the, the future president was going to be as powerful as those absolute kings and emperors of, of basically 18th century Europe. So the vision was, was very clear. The, 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 the inspiration was not really a republic. The inspiration was absolute monarchies of Europe. All the tribal chiefs, where his father was a, was a tribal chief. So that was the vision. That was the, the vision. But the argument was we need development and we need the country to develop faster and so on. And this is the, the structure that, that he created. Of course, after 25 years of being president, we were even more backward than when he found us. Uh, but we had no rights. We could not do anything. And, you know, the, that argument and the model has failed. Uh, there was a hand there, and then I'll come to you. Yes, sir. Uh, in your opinion, uh, to what extent do outside forces like the Dubai Fort World that you mentioned have a vested interest in, in keeping Tanzania corrupt so that they can exploit the country? They, they play an oversized role. Uh, running the country's ports is a multi-billion dollar business. So even, even if we don't, we don't have the, 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 uh, the documents to prove it, because they don't issue receipts when they bribe our our public officials, but I, my belief is millions of dollars would have changed hands to make the president cede control of our ports. In the nineties, in the nineties, when they were we we liberalized our mineral sector, our mining sector to create conditions for Barrick Gold and other mining multinationals to take over. And, and I told you I spent years trying to, to fight Barrick. Uh, <clears throat> when I was researching how they got hold of, of one of those mines, someone from Canada managed to obtain uh, documents from the government of Canada under the, the, the Freedom of Information Act. So he, he obtained a bunch of uh, you know, diplomatic dispatches uh, from Dar es Salaam, between Dar es Salaam and Ottawa, between the Canadian High Commission and the C Canadian Foreign Ministry. And in one of those documents, uh, I found I found a document, a message from the then Canadian High Commissioner to Tanzania, uh, writing home on the day after President Mkapa was uh, sworn in as president. And it starts by saying, our man has been sworn in as president. Uh, president Mkapa is known for his links with Canada from the time he served as Tanzania's High Commissioner in Ottawa in you know the 70s and then she added now the bullion hulu file will move the bullion hulu file bullion hulu is is uh barracks you know flagship gold mine in tanzania that's where in, in 1996 they kicked out more than 400,000 people to you know and that file had not moved prior to 1996 
because the government of President Mwini was uh, did not uh, resisted these attempts from Barrick Gold and its uh, affiliates and the pressures from the Canadian High Commission to get rid of the of the local miners. So um, Kappa comes to office in '95. In December of '95, and within days, the Canadian High Commissioner is writing home that our man has sworn, has been sworn in. Now the Bullion Hulu file will move. And it took seven months and the people were get gotten rid of and dozens were killed. So, so the corporate influence, the corporate influence on, on, on governmental decision making is, 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 is right. Yes, there was, yes. And then you and then you, yes. <laughs> Um, so I was kind of looking through some articles and like interviews that you've done, and um, you've and you've um, you've spoken about um, a new constitution, really pushing for a new constitution. So to like to what extent do you think that reform is appropriate for just like different governmental agencies and just the overall like government structure? And to what extent do you think that like there just needs to be a complete new, I guess like overhaul? in some ways, um, and I guess like a follow-up question, to what extent do you think that, because there have been like different international organizations that have called for the, um, like the current government to allow for like freedom of demonstration and free speech and stuff. And like, to what extent do you think that there is merit behind like the government actually allowing people to protest and to say what they wanna say? And I guess, like, do you foresee there being, like, pushback? We started the, the quest for constitutional reform when we were still a one-party state in the 80s. Uh, and in 1991, a presidential commission which had been established to investigate whether we needed to go multi-party or remain as a one-party state, uh, recommended that we become a multi-party state, a recommendation which was immediately accepted by, by the government. But the second and most important recommendation of that commission was a new constitution. And that constitutional uh, commission argued that the current constitution it was current in 1991. It is still in place today. So the commission said in, in 1991 that the current constitution is essentially a one-party constitution. It cannot serve a multi-party democracy. It cannot serve the, 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 the new conditions of multi-party democracy. And therefore, it has to be a, a completely overhauled to create and to create a more democratic and multi-party constitution. Uh, in other words, the commission was arguing for overhaul of the political system, changing the political power map of the Tanzanian state. That the government would not accept and the powers that be uh, rejected and they have rejected to this day. So, so the kind of constitutional reform we are talking about are those that will overhaul our state and the, the institutions of the state, which will change the balance of the balance of power between institutions of the state, the presidency, if we retain it, the legislature, the judiciary, as well as a balance of power between the state and we citizens, because we have been completely disempowered by a constitution that does not give any rights to the citizens to hold their, their elected officials to, to account. So it is, it, is, it is total overhaul. But of course, I know, and you know that that doesn't come easy, and 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 therefore 
uh, it, it will take a while. It will take it will take reforms. We'll have to go through uh, processes of um, minimalist reforms. But eventually, I think eventually we'll get we'll get a better and more democratic constitutional order because um, I, I cannot imagine us going forward like this in the next 20 years. I, I, I frankly don't see it. Yeah. Right, I'm mindful of the time. If, if this is an acceptable question, the answer to Jackie's question, to mm -hmm. combine the last two, mm -hmm. uh, as we're about to get kicked out of the room in the short period, who okay. can see where there were, there were There was a hand here? Yes. And? Tyler and... Who are the who are the next two that you had already chosen? Um, now, yes. Uh, so my question, really briefly, is with that corruption at the very top, do you think that affects or inspires abuse of power at lower levels? Everywhere. We have a system which is, if you allow me, rotten from top to bottom. Uh, as this, that system has allowed a situation where. You have on the one, one hand elected officials who are totally powerless because real power lies with unelected officials. Just as real powers, real power does between the president and the parliament lies with the president. The power parliament is just a rubber stamp. So all through the system from top, top to bottom, you have structures of, of uh, authoritarianism, you have structures of lack of accountability everywhere, and therefore your corruption is top to bottom. I, that was actually pretty much my question, but a follow-up on... Oh. <laughs> that was actually my question as well, but a follow-up on that was you mentioned that a lot of people view like tie religion to the authority of figures, like imagining that God is blessing them, so if corruption is coming all the way down to that localized level, are they still tying God to like blessing those people or just the people at the top? Uh, can you clarify? Are they? I guess I'm just asking, like, are they, if they're aware of the corruption at the lower levels, that it's not tied to religion, are they still tying corruption at the high levels to religion as well? Or are they just like viewing their like riches of the high level authority figures as blessings from God? I think uh, it, the common view is, uh, I mean, corruption starts at, you know, fit with our local leaders at the lowest levels. You know, you don't get, you don't get, uh, if you need to go to hospital because you had an accident, you need a police, a police um, letter, letter from the police saying that, well, you were involved in an accident. Otherwise, we won't get treated. Now, how do you get that, that letter from the police? You, you got to pay for it. And all and up and down. You go to clinic, you need to see the doctor, you know, you, you got to pay. So it is it is not just tied to the top. It is it is everywhere. Now, if I understood your your question correctly. Yeah, pretty pretty much. Mm. If I could take Paraga, well, no, I'm not going to do that. But we do have we do have like three more minutes actually, so we're we're okay. So yes, I see the hand, your hand, yes, and then you. So, I think you touched on a few points, but I was wondering, um, being that you've had such a challenging journey throughout, just trying to figure out how to better your country, I was wondering what your future steps are. Um, from what I understand, you want to be. Um, presidential candidate. And so I was wondering how in such a system do you hope to like overcome all the struggles? Because what you mentioned was that the system really favors one party. So if you become an opposition uh, an opposition party, what happens next? Will you be okay considering that life has already been targeted? I'll, I'll tell you what happened in the last general election. Uh, well, apart from being tear gassed several times in the course of the two-month campaign, can you imagine of a 
a leading presidential candidate of the opposition being tear gassed by the police in order to be prevented from uh, addressing a, a, a campaign rally? Well, that happened to me a, a couple of times. Apart from that, we went to the elections, people went to vote. Uh, results of the elections were declared. The president, the sitting president was declared the winner uh, with some, uh, I think 12 million votes to 1.9 of mine. So it was a really lopsided, if you believe them. But our electoral law requires the publication of those results on a constituency by constituency basis. So you have to show what the candidates got in every constituency across the country. We are still waiting for those results three years after the general election. All right. In other words, there is no proof that the sitting president was ever elected. There are no results. But was, she is a president. All right. And she is a president because our constitution says if the commission, the electoral commission declares you the winner, you are the winner. No court proceedings are allowed. No challenge of any kind is allowed. So we have a president who cannot prove that she was elected or her, she and her predecessor were elected because the, the votes that they obtained do not, do not exist. So, so the question you are raising is, so... I must be crazy to think of going to the elections again, right? Eh? Because those conditions, the conditions that allowed us to have a, a president who cannot, who cannot show, cannot prove that she was elected, the same conditions exist today. And that is a conversation that we, we are having right now. There is a conversation that I... I had uh, only two nights ago, and I have been talking about this for, for the past three years. How do we go to the next elections under the same conditions? In, 19, in 2019, we had local elections. And in, that, in those local elections, 96% of the opposition candidates were disqualified disqualified 96 percent so at the local level it is all ccm it's all the ruling party because they disqualified everybody and in the general elections in 2020 in parliamentary elections they disqualified 28 opposition candidates and therefore you have about 12 percent of members of the National Assembly, members of parliament, who were not elected because their opponents were disbarred from participating in the elections. Serious issues, serious problems. We have to find answers to. And these are very real practical problems. They are not, they're not theoretical at all. How do we go to the elections under these conditions Again, yeah, yeah. I'm very sad to say that the next class is going to start in this oh, room okay. quite soon, and so we are out of time. I wish we did have more, but let's thank uh, Mr. Lisa very much for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to keep up our tradition, uh, after a, a penny discussion on uh, some of the world's hey, hey, hey. more pressing issues. <laughs> yeah. I present to you an umbrella. It's yeah. <laughs> a token of our of our appreciation and maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll turn on the news some yeah. night. Yeah. We'll see you at a rainy rally uh -huh. with our Masters of International <laughs> Business program umbrella. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so right. much. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.
Yeah. Is it good? Was it good? Okay. Uh, to Maliza. Now, the rest of the Mikuisha, Good morning, Africa. 1140, 1145. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the and, and and the good days are uh, I go to rally. I do a lot of meetings, public meetings. And and you cannot imagine the amount of the kind of pop. And not just hope, but uh, some people are very upset about about the conditions that they are forced to live. To live. And uh, people make change when they are upset. You know, uh, people don't make the kind of change that is needed. Uh, you know, with smiles on their faces. They have to. <laughs> yeah, and you see that a lot. Yeah. And I think uh, that's that, that's a that's a good empowering people. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and uh, uh, my colleagues are very locked. I always talk about their local stuff. There is constitutional politics, that, you know. So a lot about education. It's a lot about, about education. A lot about education. A lot about education. Dealing with the very pressing uh, people are upset, uh, arrested, and they held in police jails. And if I pay a visit to a, a, a you know a, a local police station, a lot of people get released uh, because they know I'll I'll cause a stink. Uh, so, so those those kinds of things. Yeah, those kinds of. I feel yeah. uh, almost partially complicit when it comes to. I had the incredible pleasure to come actually visit India oh, about two years ago. Uh -huh. It's a Ngorgo crater, mm -hmm. incredibly beautiful out there to yeah. the Serengeti for the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. And seeing some of the safari camps working with the Maasai, putting mm -hmm. them there, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the same because I believe that they've still been removed off the lands. And it's that education. Mm -hmm. What is it from our end that we can really be doing, especially for travelers from some of these other businesses or non-government? Like, what if can we, we could find a way, if we could find a way of showing people that there are tourist dollars uh, causing murder and mayhem in this place, it would be better. Because I could see them being built, especially out there. Yeah. Uh, in Gorongoro. Gorongoro is the most the most lucrative uh, tourist attraction in the country. Brings in hundreds of millions of dollars annually. And the Maasai, those who who you have you have those wildlife because this Maasai have been there four hundred years. And they are some of the poorest people in the country. Maasai have been reduced to begging, begging for food in, in, a, in, a, in a, 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 a place which brings in hundreds of millions of dollars revenue annually is simply because uh, people don't know. It's wild to see the resort. People love the animals. They don't know how, how their love of this beautiful place uh, is actually funding funding genocide. I mean, the difference between the resorts and then even the mud footage yes. structures, it's wild. 
uh, we can continue the oh, conversation, we but we do have to do it outside the room. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you don't want to. You don't want to see uh, Professor Pimentel angry. Oh, you don't. It's not. <laughs> It was fresh and popping. I see. Yeah. So the guy is all you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just for yeah. Let's take it to the hallway. Yeah. Thank you.